Greetings and welcome to the introduction to physical science. In this lecture, we are going to talk about potential energy, a little different than the kinetic energy that we looked at last time. If you recall, kinetic energy was energy of motion and potential energy is the potential to be able to do work. So in a sense, it is a way of storing energy. So let's go ahead and get started and look at this and what we see for example when we look at doing work against gravity is a way of storing energy. So there is a force that is needed to lift an object and that is equal to its weight and the weight of an object is the mass times the gravitational acceleration what you may recall is 9.8 meters per second squared on the surface of Earth. So it would be different if we were thinking about this on another object, then the weight would change, although the mass would not. So the work is equal to the force times the distance, but that force is just m times g. So the potential energy is then given by m times g times h. So the mass times the gravitational force times the height through which the object is lifted. Now the gravitational potential energy depends only on the relative positions of the objects. So we can define our own zero point which can be convenient for the specific problem. So not as there's no specific zero point for the general general uh, gravitational potential energy that we can say it could be at the Earth's surface, but we might want to for the purposes of a problem define it a certain distance above the Earth's surface, say the top of a table. If that is where something is resting, we may find that to be more convenient to be the definition of the zero point of potential energy. And again, what we're looking for is the change in the gravitational potential energy being equal to the mass times the gravitational force times the height through which it is raised. So let's go ahead and look at an example of this. And we'll start here looking at the uh, here at a clock. And we want to look at the change in the potential energy when the mass hung from a cuckoo clock is raised by one meter. So let's go ahead and again we have our sketch here of our problem and we want to identify what we know. So let's take a look. We know that the mass is 0.5 kilograms. The height through which it is raised is one meter and the gravitational acceleration is 9.8 meters per second squared. Now we know that we're looking for the change in potential energy, which is given by the mass times the gravitational force times the height. Well, we know all three of those numbers. We know the mass here. We know the height here. And we know the gravitational force here. So we can put those values into our equation and find that if we multiply the three of those together, we then get 4.90 kilogram meter squared per second squared as the change in potential energy. Now that is also equal to a Newton meter, which would be a kilogram meter per second squared times the meter which is a joule. So the change in potential energy again has the same units as kinetic energy that we looked at in a previous lecture. And it is in this case 4.90 joules. So that is how much energy is now stored by the work of the clock raising that the uh, pendulum up that distance. So let's continue on here and look at a little more when we look at potential energy calculations, what we want to consider is that it's a little it can be a little different than some others, because it depends only on the change in the height. And that means the path does not matter at all. So this can make things a lot simpler. If we are moving a television set from the ground up to a several up several stories, then it does not matter whether we use a pulley to pull it straight up 
or whether someone carries it up a number of flights of steps to get it there. Each of those in both case A and case B, the change in potential is exactly the same. And it is equal to the mass of the television times the gravitational force times the height through which it is moved. The path through which it takes does not matter. The, the total potential energy only depends on the net change in the height. So if you carried it up the stairs a couple flights, carried it back down and then carried it up again, the potential energy change would be exactly the same. And the work done is exactly the same in both cases because the work depends and the potential energy depends only on the change in the height. So let's look at an example here. And what we want to look at is here a roller coaster track. And as we start this, we're going to look at the final. We're looking for the final speed of the roller coaster that starts from rest at the top of a 20 meter hill. So the meter, the hill is 20 meters above the ground here. And we want to find what is the velocity over at the end here. So let's go ahead and we have our diagram here. Let's put in what we know. And we have we know the initial velocity of zero. We know that the height is equal to 20 meters. So now we want to use that to find the velocity. Well, what can we use? Well, we know that the change in kinetic energy is the difference in the kinetic energy at the end. Well, that's the velocity that we're looking for. So that's very useful and the velocity, the kinetic energy that it started with. If you remember, this is the work energy theorem that we looked at previously. And the change in kinetic energy, because energy is conserved, the change in kinetic energy is equal to the change in potential energy. So the potential energy change from the roller coaster going from the top here to this level that gives us a change in potential energy that is going to be equal to the change in kinetic energy. And that means that the potential energy mgh here is equal to the kinetic energy 1 half mv squared. Now what happened to this term? Well remember the initial velocity is 0 and since 0 squared is 0 and everything else multiplied by 0 is 0 this is 0 and goes away. So we know that mgh equals 1 half mv squared and now we're going to find that we know everything here. Or does or do we? Is there something missing? What is the mass of the uh, what is the mass of the roller coaster? But that doesn't matter because mass is on both sides and will cancel. So we really have that g times h equals one half v squared. So we solve that then for v, v is the square root of 2 times g times h. And if we put our known numbers in, we find that the final velocity at the end of the hill end of the track there is 19.8 meters per second. So again, we had does not it is independent of the mass. How much mass is on this makes no difference because the masses cancel. It doesn't matter whether you have more or less mass, it will end up exactly the same when it gets to the finish. So now look, let's look at a second example when we're changing in this case is that the initial speed is five meters per second. So we're starting off with a little bit of velocity. The coaster was not completely at rest, but was slightly moving when things started. So again, this starts out the same. What do we know? And we have the work energy theorem. But now we have to note that the initial velocity is no longer zero. So we can't just get rid of this term. We have to keep that term. So potential energy and kinetic energy are the same. That does not change. So now mgh equals 1 half mv squared minus 1 half mv zero squared. Note the masses still all cancel. So the masses are gone and it still does not depend on the mass of the coaster at all. And now we have to solve. It's going to be a little bit more complicated. But v is equal to the square root of 2gh plus v0 squared. 
So if you rearrange all of this, you should find that you get this for your equation. And then plugging in our numbers that we have. And if we solve that, we find that the velocity is now 20.4 meters per second. So even though it started with a little bit of velocity, it only gains a smaller amount as it heads through the track. All right, let's continue onward with this and let's look at what we mean by conservative forces. So what is a conservative force? A conservative force is one where the work done depends only upon the starting and ending points. It does not depend on the path that you take. So what's an example of this? A gravitational force is a conservative force. It doesn't matter the path that you take in a gravitational field. The work done depends only on where you start and where you end. So that's an example of that. A spring. Winding a spring stores the energy and it does not depend on the exact path taken. You may extend the spring and contract the spring, but it only matters where you end up. Potential energy, the energy of a system that is due to position, uh, shape or configuration. So this is a stored energy. Remember stored energy, potential energy is an example of stored energy, something that can be recovered. So again, it is an example, it, it has an example of something that is conserved, you can get energy, and you can convert potential energy into kinetic energy, and they can convert back and forth. And we saw that in our roller coaster example that we just did that potential energy could be converted into kinetic energy and we could use that equality of the two to solve a problem. So let's look at an example for the potential energy of a spring. And what we look at is what is called Hooke's law, which said the force is equal to a constant k times x, where x is the displacement from the undisturbed position. So if the spring is unstretched and just left alone, it has stretched some amount. And that is the undisturbed position. If we then stretch it an additional amount here, that is now x. That is how much it has been stretched. So the force is equal to k, the force constant, times that stretch. And the potential energy of the spring is 1 half k x squared. So the same force constant here and here we use the same force constant in both and here it depends on the square of the displacement. So the further you get away from the spring the more potential energy is stored and the higher the force. Okay so how about conservation of energy? How do we conserve energy? Well we know that when we're looking at only conservative forces that the uh, potential energy is conserved. The change in kinetic energy plus the change in potential energy is always zero. So if the kinetic energy increases, the potential energy decreases and vice versa. They will always, the changes will always be the same. Or we can use that the kinetic energy plus the potential energy is a constant. So if one is increased, the other must decrease in order to be the same. And we can also look at the sum of the kinetic and potential energy initial and final must be the same. So we're really saying the same thing in three different ways here that this is three ways of saying that when we're looking only at conservative forces that this is how things will work. Energy can change, energy can change form. It very easily changes from kinetic to potential energy, but the total energy always remains constant. And when we're looking at only conservative forces, then the total energy will never change. So the total energy will never change and energy cannot be lost. Energy cannot be lost in any case, but when we have non-conservative forces, such as friction, for example, then energy can be dissipated and can be lost from the system. It may be turned into heat and gone from the system, but the energy was still there. It just may no longer be able to convert between kinetic. That part of it can no longer convert between kinetic and potential energy.
So let's look at an example here. And what we want to look at is a toy car being propelled by a spring. So the track rises a certain amount and the spring is compressed by a certain amount and has a force constant. So this would be that K force constant that we know. So let's go keep our little diagram here. So what we find here, we have the values that we know, and we can look at our equation, which says kinetic energy initial plus potential energy initial is equal to the sum of the final kinetic and potential energies. And if we write those out, we find out that the kinetic energy is the energy of motion. So what is the velocity of the car at the beginning of this? And what is the potential energy? Well, potential energy can depend on two things and can be the gravitational potential energy and is the potential energy of the spring. So the sum of the potential energies, this would be the initial energy, kinetic and potential. At the end, the kinetic energy depends on the motion and also depends on any potential energy from gravity and any potential energy from the spring. Now, it looks very complicated, but we're going to be able to eliminate a lot of this because what we know is that the initial velocity is zero, so it hasn't started moving. It isn't changing any height, so that's nothing. And we know that the uh, final potential energy, remember this is before it rises, so that's gone. And at the end, the spring is not stretched. So essentially, we are taking the initial potential energy of the spring and converting that into kinetic energy of the car. So we've gotten rid of a lot of those terms and only have to look at a couple of them. And we can then solve for the final velocity, which is the square root of k over m times the displacement. And if we put in the values that we know for that, that we have from above, and we then uh, calculate, we find that the final velocity is 2.00 meters per second. So let's continue with this example and look at another thing. Now we want to find the, the value at the top of the slope. So instead of just before it starts, we want to find what it is up here once it's reached that height of 18 meters. So our numbers are all the same. We're not changing anything except that we're looking for it at a different point. So our, we start out the same and everything there is exactly the same. However, now we don't we aren't able to eliminate quite as much. We have to keep some more terms. We still know that the initial velocity is zero and the initial height is zero. And we know that the spring is no longer stretched. But we do have this term because there is now a gravitational potential energy at the end. So the car, as you might expect, will have slowed down after having moved up the uh, ramp. So we can still calculate this and we can solve our equation here a little bit more complicated, but the same procedure to solve for the final velocity, you will get this and put in all of our numbers that we have and find that the final velocity is 0.687 meters per second. And as you might expect, that's less than it would have been otherwise. That is smaller than it would have been at the top at the bottom of the ramp. Now remember, it does not matter which path the car takes to get there. This velocity applies to the path of the car in the purple up there, but it also implies to the looped path down below. The same velocity will occur at the top regardless of which path that is taken. So that's one of the things to remember. The path does not matter in these cases. It only matters for the uh, the initial and final states. Now if we added in something like friction, remember that we neglected friction here, then that would be different because the much longer path would have more friction. And that friction would be an example of a non conservative force. So let's go ahead and finish up with our summary here. And what we looked at this time is potential energy. Stored energy, for example, gravity or in a spring is a way of storing energy that can then be released and converted into another type of energy.
The zero point for gravitational energy is, depends on the specific problem and can be selected. So you can determine where that zero point is. And in fact, in our previous problem, we could have just as easily selected the zero point to be the top of the ramp and not the bottom. And we would have gotten exactly the same answer in either case. And then we looked at conservative forces and those are forces that depend only on the initial and final positions and not the path that is taken between them. And we saw that in our last example that the answer would be exactly the same if we were to, regardless of which path we were taking to move that car from one end to the other. So that concludes this lecture on potential energy. We'll be back again next time for another topic in physical science. So until then, have a great day everyone, and I will see you in class.